Good morning. Please stand with us as we start our worship today.
Good morning. You may be seated. My name is Stephen Sessing. I'm one of the pastors here. It isn't amazing. Spring is springing. The buds on the trees, all the birds. I was saying to my wife, like just seeing all the different kinds of birds, I feel like there's more birds in there. Maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like it. Uh, so we have a lot of announcements this morning. So first, we have my favorite event of the year coming up, the AGM. <laughs> Maybe it's not your favorite, but it's really important. Um, so the AGM is next week, Wednesday, April the 24th at 7 p.m. Let me say that again. Next week, Wednesday, April 24th at 7 p.m. We'd really appreciate it, appreciate it, especially if you remember that you would make it out because we want to make sure we have enough people to vote and to talk about things and to get things through. Now, if you're on the church emailing list, you should have received an email regarding the AGM booklet. If you, if you can go there, you can get the booklet. And if you don't, if you're not on the church uh, emailing list, there should be a URL. Yep, right there, URL, evergreenheights.org slash AGM2024. So if you're not on the emailing list, you can go there, and you should be able to download a booklet. Now, you might say to me, Stephen, I don't have access to the internet. And I say to you, we've got you covered. We're going to have physical, some physical copies at the back after the service. So if you just go into the foyer to the info hub, there should be some physical copies for you if you don't have internet to access it. And if you say to me, Stephen, well, I have kids. I don't know if I can make it to the April 24th. I would say to you, we've got that problem solved too. We've got kids care. So there's no reason not to come. If you're not a member, you are still welcome to come to the AGM. You just won't be able to vote but you'll be able to listen to everything we're talking about, and you'll even be able to ask questions. Uh, one thing I should note is we're still having to go um, from the accountants. We're still needing a final copy of the audit. Once that comes through, that should be next week. The AGM booklet will be updated by the end of next week, so that isn't put on there yet just because there hasn't been, uh, we haven't done the final kind of work through with uh, the finance people. The accountants, that's the right word. Um, uh, also, because of the AGM, we're going to be having 24 hours of prayer before. And so I would really just, you know, encourage you, ask you to sign up for a one-hour slot. Uh, you can go on the church website. You'll be able to find it there. Also, you should have received an email. And so you can kind of, kind of just hit the link on the email and go there, and you can uh, find that. And you can sign up for an hour for prayer before the AGM. Third, we have our... Next seniors event coming up on April 22nd. If you want to go to that, you have to sign up at the info hub or sign up online, and you have one day left to do that, today and tomorrow. So if you want to go to that, you have today and tomorrow to sign up. That's on April 22nd, so that will be next week Monday. Next week Monday, and that's a lunch. Um, so yeah, we just encourage you, if you are 55 or over, you can attend that. If you're getting close to 55, you are also welcome to attend. Don't feel like that 55 is just a cutoff. Um, fourth is giving. So there's multiple ways that you can give here. You can do e-transfer. You can give at the special black box in the back by the office. And there's also, you can do it online. There's many ways you can give here. And so we just, just I'd say thank you as a pastor for your faithful giving. Uh, it's something that just helps us to keep on running and doing what we do. And last but not least is the men's Bible study. If you are a man and you want to come to a Bible study, we meet on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. We're starting a new series, Working Through the Book of Acts. And so I just, any man that's here, I just welcome you to come at 7 p.m. Uh, we're going to be working through the Book of Acts. We're going to be using, I'll be using a commentary uh, from Dr. Craig Keener, which is a really great commentary as we kind of work our way through that. But let's, uh, let's pray as we head into the rest of our service. Lord, we thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you are good. Father, there's a lot of things coming up in our church regarding AGM and, and decisions and all those things. Lord, would you be with us? Would you give us wisdom? Would you ground us in you, Jesus? Just pray that you would lead us as we continue in worship. In Jesus' name, amen.
a seat. Well, we're going to enter into a time of spiritual practice uh, this morning. But before we do that, we wanted to take just a couple of minutes to talk about why we even do these spiritual practices here at Evergreen in the first place. If you've been uh, involved at Evergreen for a while, this will be familiar to you, but some of you have kind of joined us in the last little while, and it might seem like sometimes we do these spiritual practices in the service and they can feel kind of different or awkward. Um, so why do we do it? Why do we take the time to kind of uh, set aside space in our services for spiritual practices? Well, this is a journey that we've kind of been on for several years now as a church where we started to notice how consumeristic um, our culture is and how easy it is to kind of just come to church and to sit back and to just kind of take it all in, right? And maybe notice the things that we like or the things that we don't like or the things that we agree with or the things that we don't agree with, but to never really uh, be changed, never really be transformed by God's presence. And we believe that God has a bigger invitation for us when we gather together as his people, right? We're called as followers of Jesus to be people whose lives are being transformed by the love of God. We're called to be people whose lives are taking shape in the ways of Jesus. And that's not something that we can do on our own. I don't know if you've ever tried to live out the ways of Jesus kind of by your own strength. I think we all do that from time to time, but it doesn't work, right? Jesus calls us to this radical countercultural way of life and it's up to his spirit uh, to transform us from the inside out. And so these moments when we pause in the service to reflect, to pray, to do these different practices, it's just an invitation to kind of open ourselves up to God and to say we're here, we're open, we're ready, we are available for what you want to do in us and through us. And so that's the invitation this morning. One of the most radical countercultural things that Jesus calls us to as his disciples, and something that was just as radical and countercultural in the world that he lived in, is to be people who love not just our friends, not just the people that like us, not just the people who think like us, not just the people that we agree with or that we're on the same uh, political camp as, but to even go as far as to love our enemies. And I think we all kind of love the idea of loving our enemies, right? There's something that's kind of compelling about that. We all want to be people who love in ways that are extravagant. But in real life, it's hard. It's hard, right? And so uh, we're going to enter into a time of prayer for our enemies. This is something that Jesus calls us to in the book of Matthew. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. God causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And so we're going to take some time to open ourselves before God and to ask him to transform us into people who love our enemies, who em embody this radical kind of love. So first I'm gonna invite you to take a moment to just center yourself in God's presence. Get comfortable in your seat. Take a couple deep breaths. This is where it begins. We can't extend God's love to others without receiving it ourselves. And so take a moment to let yourself be reminded this morning that you are loved. You are seen, you are known, you are heard, and you are loved exactly as you are. God's love is as close as the air that you're breathing. And I'm going to invite you to take a moment and to just think about somebody who you might consider your enemy or even just somebody that you find difficult to love. 
and to just name that person before God. He already knows. He won't be surprised. And this might feel a little bit strange, but I'm going to invite you to just name before God all of the things that you don't like about that person. All of the things that frustrate you, that you find difficult to love in that person. And just name those things before God. He already knows. He is the safest person to vent to. And now as you remain centered in God's presence, take a moment to name before God all of the things that you imagine might bother that person about you. What do you think might bother that person about you? And just name that before God. now as you remain centered in God's presence, take a moment to name before God all of the things that you admire or appreciate about the person you're praying for. And we know, we believe, we trust that every single person is made in the image of God and is a person that Jesus died for. Just take a moment to name before God the things that you appreciate or admire about the person you're praying for. And now take a moment to name before God some of your own unique strengths, some of your own gifts, some of the things that others might admire or appreciate about you. And now take a moment and pray that God would bless the person that you're praying for. Maybe that he would bless them in their jobs, in their health, in their family life. Just pray a blessing over the person you are praying for, as difficult as it may be. Hold yourself before God and pray that God would bless you. Where do you need to experience God's blessing? And before we wrap up, take a moment to just ask God if there's any next step that he's calling you to take, any action he's calling you to, just to move one step closer towards reconciliation with the person that you've been praying for. God, we thank you that you are a God who loves radically, unconditionally, that you love us, God, that you love us when we're at our best and you love us when we're at our worst. You love us in our successes and you love us in our failures. God, you're with us in all of it. And God, we are 
we, we want to be people who extend that same kind of love to others. And so as challenging as that is, as difficult as that is in real life, God, we just come before you and ask that your spirit would continue to work in us, to transform us, to change the way we see others. Help us to see other people through your eyes. Help us to love other people with your love. And may we be people who, as we do this, represent your kingdom in our broken worlds. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as we continue in worship?
Amen. Thank you, worship team. So, who here is a board game person? A few. We've got a few hands. Okay. Well, I loved board games. Still do today. Loved them growing up, though. And I remember when I was a youth and young adults pastor, that in my spare time, often I would go with my youth leaders and we play board games at a house. We'd go over to someone's house, maybe at an acreage, and we'd play board games together. And a few of my youth leaders were very competitive. And so you can imagine sometimes there was some quite intense games. Now, a show of hands, who here has played Monopoly at least once? You only had to play it once? Okay, so pretty much everyone I think here has played Monopoly at least once. Um, and for, if you haven't, and you'll, I am sorry that you never played Monopoly. Uh, I think it's a great game, at least in my opinion. I know some people I've talked to have no time for board games or really dislike Monopoly, and I say to you, bah humbug. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who've never played, Monopoly is the world's best-selling board game. It's sold over 275 million copies worldwide. That's more than any other board game. And in case you don't know what Monopoly is, you have a board, and you have a character, and everyone has dice. You throw the dice, and your character works your way around the board. And as you land on things, you buy properties. And the more properties you get, sometimes you can build monopolies and build property. And as other people go around the board, if they land on your property, well, they owe you money. <clears throat> and basically, the goal of the game is to build monopolies and to make your friends go bankrupt. That's how you win. It's really a Jesus-centered game, if you think about it, you know, just making your friends go bankrupt. It's just really, really Christian-like. Uh, so for those here who have played, how many of you have actually read the rules? Just raise your hand. I just want to see how many people have read the rules. Okay, so very few people. I'm not surprised. It's always to my horror that whenever I play with Monopoly, most people have never read the rules. They've never taken time. They may be familiar with some parts of the game, you know, like you roll the dice and you go around the board kind of thing. But for me, I'm kind of a stickler when it comes to rules. I want to know, how do you play the game right? And so for me, I've always going to go back to the rules, make sure I read them. And to my utter dismay, when I began playing Monopoly with my youth leaders, I realized that they had tons of house rules. Now, if you don't know what house rules are, house rules are essentially additional rules people add to the game of Monopoly. Sometimes it's a a totally different rule. Sometimes they'll take a rule in the game and they'll change it a little bit. Uh, but what happens with this is kind of everything can go into chaos because often people have different house rules. And so sometimes we would actually like fight, not like physically, but like we would fight as youth leaders, which house rules are we playing with? And if you do a Google search, you'll find that there's like, I, I, I don't even want to count. There was just so many different kinds of house rules that people had. And the hard part of it is that not everyone agrees on what the house rules should be. And even worse, is sometimes people don't understand the original rules. So how can you make house rules when you don't even know the first rules to begin with? Now, you could, could you imagine if I went over to someone's house, and I went over there to play Monopoly, and I decided I wanted my house rules to rule? It's usually the person who's hosting the game that decides what the house rules are. But you decide, anyone who doesn't play by your rules, well, are they even playing Monopoly? I mean, like, my house rules are the best. They're, they're superior. Their house rules are really dumb. You know, and you even begin to think to yourself, like, Hasbro, like, they should come to me and I can write the rules for Monopoly. Like, I'm, I'm the best Monopoly person in the world. Now, people might think you're a bit crazy and a bit off your rocker, and you would be if you thought that way. But in some ways, this is the attitude of the Pharisees towards Sabbath and towards Torah. Now, I do want to give credence where credence is due. Sabbath, Torah, these are things that they considered sacred, and hopefully you do not consider monopoly sacred. So there's a bit of a difference. But, I mean, there's, there's kind of a bit of a comparison there. <clears throat> We're going to be in Luke 1, 6, 1 to 11 this morning. And the Pharisees here believe that they are the right interpreters of Sabbath. They are the ones who have the authority. They are the ones whose house rules win the day. And so when it comes to Sabbath observance, they think they're in the right. Everyone else is in the wrong. But Jesus is saying, I am the ruler of the Sabbath and Torah. Sabbath is meant as a means of life, not rules that crush life and try to force God's hand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are with us this morning. 
Lord, we thank you that you make yourself known to us as we read the Gospel of Luke. Would you speak through me as I preach, as I handle the text of Scripture? May I handle it with diligence and care. Lord, form us into the image of your Son through the work of your Spirit. Convict us, change us, mold us, Lord. May it not just be a message that comes in one ear and goes out the other, Lord, but work in us. May your will be done in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So if you have your Bible, turn to Luke 6, and we're going to be reading from verses 1 to 11. Luke 6, 1 to 11. <coughs> CSB, if you're wondering, it's on the, it's on the thing. <laughs> on a Sabbath, this is Jesus, he passed through the grain fields. His disciples were picking heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands and eating them. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, Haven't you read what David and those who were with him did when he was hungry? How he entered the house of God, and how he took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. He even gave them some to those who were with him. Then he told them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. A man who was there, whose right hand was shriveled, the scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath so that they could find a charge against him. But he knew their thoughts. And he told the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand here. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it. After looking around at them all, he said, he told him, stretch out your hand. He did, and his hand was restored. They, however, were filled with rage and started discussing with one another what they might do to Jesus. The word of the Lord. In verses 1 to 11, we have two kind of confrontations, two times of tension between the Pharisees and Jesus, and both happen on the Sabbaths. We've seen this earlier in chapter 5 of Jesus doing things on the Sabbath and the Pharisees get really angry. Now, if you've grown up in church, you've probably heard of Sabbath. You've maybe thought of Sabbath a bit. But I think it's important that we dive into what Sabbath is for a first century Jewish person, for us to understand why there is so much conflict in the Gospels between Jesus and the Pharisees. Now, you might have a question this morning, why don't we do Sabbath practices in part, it's because Jesus fulfills the law, as well as Jesus and his resurrection changes how we understand the function of Sabbath today. But I don't have time to really unpack that question this morning. So if you have questions, feel free to come and talk to me. In the ancient Jewish world, Sabbath was not just a Sunday. The word Sabbath or Shabbat in Hebrew means just to cease, to desist, to stop. On this, the last day of the week, they were just to stop. Stop what they're doing. Take time to rest. Take time to worship God in community. It was a time of rest, of worship. For the Jewish people, there was theology, intentionality, reasons why they did this. Sabbath was central to their identity. It was the defining characteristic, actually, of Judaism in the first century. This is something that marked them apart, that marked their relationship with Yahweh. And you know, sometimes when we think of church, we just think of us coming to church. But for Jewish people, Sabbath was more than that. Their animals, their land, everything was to partake in Sabbath. I'm not sure about you, but when I was a teenager, when I would go to church on Sunday, I really didn't have a lot going in in my mind. Usually it was just like, well, we're going to church. I'm going to listen to another sermon. I'm going to go listen to some worship. Just going to kind of sit there for a bit. But for them, Sabbath was central. So what made it so important? What, why were they so obsessed with it? Well, Sabbath is the, fir one of, is the first commandment in the Ten Commandments that's based from Genesis. This command to keep Sabbath is grounded in how God created the world. So the Jewish people were patterning their life off of God's creation. In Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11, it says, Remember the Sabbath day. To keep it holy, you are to labor six days and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work, you, your son, 
or your daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock, the resident alien who is within your city gates, for the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. Second, in Deuteronomy, Sabbath was required to keep because it represented God's rescue of Israel from Egypt. It was to remind them that they are not to just work and work and work. They actually need to take time to rest. In Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 15 is where this command is. I'm just going to read verse 15. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord God brought you out of there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. For the Jewish people, Sabbath pointed to salvation from Egypt. That they were saved from Yahweh and now they can rest. That they're no longer oppressed. This was fundamental for their understanding. Exodus, we have two feasts that actually the Jews celebrate that come from Exodus. This was central to their understanding, Passover. That God rescues and God creates. Sabbath worship, when they would meet on this day, was a way of reinforcing this theology of God's creation and of God's salvation for them. And third, Sabbath was an important marker of Jewish identity because it's something that set them apart. They would come together much like we are on a Sunday and they would worship together. They would speak about Torah and it was something that would bind them because they saw that none of the other pagan nations did this. It'd be kind of like if you're part of a hard of like a hard to get into club or sports team. Have you ever been part of a club or a group or something like around a hobby or sports team? What do you do? Well, you meet, you share that common interest, you spend time, you do it for a long time, and you begin to build bonds because you're bonding around something that's central. I remember when I was playing basketball as a teenager and I was on this team for a while and we were playing a game and it got really chippy. Some of the guys were saying things to each other that they shouldn't have been saying and I'm sure like no one, none of you have ever done that in the game, you know, like hockey parents never say things they shouldn't. But um, I just remember it getting really chippy and I remember like almost a fight actually broke out during the game. And I don't exactly remember kind of what happened to precipitate it, but I remember the adrenaline was high and the teams, we were ready to go. And thankfully, I don't remember what happened, but somehow things calmed down. And so lucky for the other team, at least in my opinion. But uh, <laughs> cooler heads prevailed. But the time we spent in practice, the time we spent in games, the time we spent talking as a team, that bonded us so that when things got tough, we were ready to go. Sabbath in some ways did this. It bonded them together. Now, the consequences for following Sabbaths were pretty severe. It was death. If you didn't follow Sabbath, you would die. But there's a problem. The Old Testament doesn't actually give a lot of explanation as to what is work and what is not work. There are a few examples in the Old Testament, such as, you know, picking up too much manna, uh, starting a fire, gathering sticks. But other than that, there's not really much in the Old Testament that explains what is work and what is not. And so what happens? The Pharisees see this, and they realize, well, we've got to keep Sabbath holy, so we better make a whole bunch of rules. And so they make a whole bunch of rules that really sometimes have nothing to do with Scripture. In later Jewish writings, we have something called the Mishnah. This is a second century document that was used to show kind of things that they shouldn't do so that they wouldn't break Sabbath. And so in this list, we have things such as plowing, hunting, butchering, these are kind of things we might expect. We also have some things that seem kind of weird, like tying or loosening of a knot, sewing more than one stitch, writing more than one letter. The rabbis tried to offer a rule, or at least a precedent, for every possible Sabbath question you might have. And what's interesting, too, is the rabbis are actually well aware that what they're doing goes far beyond the scope of Scripture. The Mishnah itself says, the rules about Sabbath are as mountains hanging by a hair, for scripture is scanty and the rules many. So what happened? There's this obsession with Sabbath, but why? Why so much? Why are the Pharisees getting so angry? Well, we know that they saw it as holy, but even more so, they tied their national fate to the keeping of Torah, to the keeping of Sabbath. 
the Pharisees, just like the other Jews, were longing for a Messiah. And they thought, if we can just do this right, if we can just keep Torah, if we can keep Sabbath, if we can follow the law, if we can please God, then perhaps it will quicken the coming of the Messiah. They thought if they were faithful, if they followed the law, if they did enough, then it would create the conditions necessary for the coming of the Messiah and God's kingdom. N.T. Wright speaks to this. The Pharisees became largely concerned with manufacturing the conditions necessary for Israel's restoration through a strict regime of Torah, seeking to draw Israel towards the conditions that would hasten its restoration before God and its elevation over the surrounding nations. The Pharisees were wanting to create the conditions for the Messiah to come. They knew they couldn't force God to act, but perhaps if we just did enough, if everyone was doing what they should, then perhaps God will move and will be safe. So when Jesus comes along, he's breaking all their house rules. He's throwing all their hard work into the air and saying it doesn't matter. And the Pharisees are getting really angry. And and you can kind of understand it. Why? Because they're thinking, Jesus, you're screwing up the coming of the Messiah. What are you doing? Jesus is a threat. He's dangerous. He's putting the nation at risk. The problem is they don't understand the Messiah is right in front of them. They're blinded by their power. They're blinded by their fear for their need of control. Blinded because they want to keep the oral law and Jesus isn't having it. They don't realize the creator, the ruler of the rules, the one who created the house in the first place of heaven and earth is right in front of them. First point this morning is that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He is Lord of the Sabbath. Here in this passage, we learn that the disciples are picking heads of grain and it seems that they're eating them. And I find it quite funny. I don't know if like the Pharisees are like hiding in the field or something, but the Pharisees just happen to be there. And they're like, what are you doing? What is unlawful? I mean, they're obviously obsessed about Jesus. They're, they just like, I mean, Jesus is taking up their whole headspace and they, they accuse him for breaking the law. Now, is Jesus breaking the law? Maybe his disciples are. But what the disciples are doing is actually allowable in Scripture. In Deuteronomy 23, 24 to 25, actually addresses this. Yet the Pharisees, because of their extra laws, because of all the things that they were teaching, the oral law, they now thought, oh, we've got Jesus. He's breaking the law. They're using their interpretation and the expansion of the law to stop Jesus and his disciples from doing something that Scripture actually allows. They're worried. Jesus is leading people astray. He's not following our house rules. What is he doing? And according to the Mishnah, Jesus could be committing four offenses. They could be, con- they could be kind of charged with reaping, threshing, threshing, winnowing, and preparing grain, all which, which were forbidden. The problem is the Mishnah and oral tradition are not scripture. The Pharisees are making themselves Lord of the Sabbath. They're saying, we rule. And Jesus responds to the Pharisees by pointing to a story in Samuel, 1 Samuel 21, 1 to 9. In this story, we have David. He's running from Saul. Saul's chasing after David and his men. And so David, he goes to the priest and asks, can I have the bread of the presence? And so David, the priest, gives the bread of the presence to David and his men, and so then they eat. The thing is, this happens on Sabbath. Is this is when the bread was put out. So Jesus places the Pharisees in a quandary. If scripture doesn't rebuke David for taking the showbread on Sabbath, and if his men can eat it, and if the priests can give it, and the scripture doesn't rebuke either of them, who are they to rebuke Jesus and his disciples for just taking a few heads of grain? The Pharisees are straining a gnat, taking and going to the extreme with a few heads of grain. Who are they to judge Jesus when scripture doesn't judge Jesus? Are the Pharisees really going to sit over judgment over King David and say, well, Jesus, King David was wrong. No, they're not going to say it because King David was the greatest king and the Messiah was supposed to come from the very line of David. There's also a deeper layer here. Jesus is choosing this story purposely. There's some debate among scholars, but I believe that Jesus is connecting himself to David and his men. Jesus, as we know from the Gospel of Luke, is the Davidic Messiah. He's from the line of David. He's the one who's going to take the throne, and the Pharisees may not even perceive it. Jesus has the same right as David, and even more so regarding Sabbath. 
He's not controlled by the Pharisees' rule on Sabbath, but rather he dictates the rules of Sabbath. Then in verse 5, Jesus ups the ante a bit more. He tells the Pharisees, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is pointing to his identity with the preceding story of David and the saying that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And I, I don't have time to unpack Son of Man language and what this all means. I hope to do that soon. But kind of a short version is it's going back to Daniel 7 and the Son of Man mentioned there. The Son of Man and David were both seen as priestly figures, authorities to perform work on Sabbath. So Jesus is saying, I have a priestly right to do this. And not only I am Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus is saying something dangerous here. He's saying that he is Lord of the Sabbath. For him to say that is almost blasphemy. It's Yahweh who instituted Sabbath. It's Yahweh who commanded Sabbath. It's Yahweh who made Sabbath holy. And yet here Jesus is saying, I am Lord of the Sabbath. It's interesting here that the Pharisees don't respond, but I wonder, perhaps they're recognizing that Jesus could accuse them of taking Yahweh's place as Lord of the Sabbath because of their implementation of laws that are not in Scripture. They're making the house rules when they don't have a right to. Especially so because the Pharisees aren't even from the line of priests. They're trying to enforce Sabbath, but that's the priest's duty, not the Pharisees. The Pharisees are responding to Jesus out of fear and control. Why? Jesus is challenging their paradigms. He's making them think differently. He's pushing back against their control. And the Pharisees think, this man is dangerous. Israel's in trouble. We've got to get rid of him. Is Jesus Lord of our life? Do we have control of the sacred? Now, we may not see Sabbath the same today, but the Pharisees loved their rules around Sabbath and they wanted to keep Sabbath. But what are the things that are most important to you? Does Jesus have control of them? What do we put our security in? The Pharisees are putting their security in Sabbath worship. Do we have our security maybe in our money, in our stocks, in our house, maybe in our brand of politics, maybe even our spouse, our children, our church, maybe a pastor? We all know that these things can fail. Stocks can go down. A pastor can have a moral failure. A church can go down a direction that's not helpful. Would we, would we be willing to let Jesus take the center of our lives? It's easy to say Jesus is Lord. It's another thing to actually submit to him as Lord and put our whole trust in him. Would we allow Jesus' house rules to be the rules that govern our life? Submission is a difficult thing. We often want things our own way. We want our house rules, but Jesus is the ruler. It's his house. I remember when I was 18 or so, and I remember I was uh, just still in high school and I was working and I made a lot of money. So I used my money to buy a video game that glorified the mobster and gangster lifestyle. I figured it's my money. I can play this game. I bought it. Do you hear all the I statements already? I, I, I. I was making myself Lord of my life, Lord of my money, Lord of my free time. So I was playing the game for a week and my older sister came home from Bible college to visit the family. Some of you know where this is going already. And my sister, being the woman that she is, a very strong woman, saw me playing the video game, and she knew what it was. And so, being the godly woman that she was, she challenged me quite strongly and directly. Did I want to hear it? Not at all. But she was right, and she gave it to me both barrels. <laughs> you know, I wanted my house rules. No one usually likes to hear they're sinning or they're doing something that would dishonor God. I wanted to stay Lord of my video games, Lord of my free time, Lord of my hobbies. And my sister was letting me know that's not the way it's supposed to be. I was convicted and so I threw it away into the garbage. Jesus is Lord, objectively. But the question is, will we submit to him? Do we want our house rules or do we want Jesus' house rules? It's his house after all, it's his creation. Second point is Jesus brings life when we submit. He brings life when we submit. In the next passage, verses 6 to 11, Jesus is again in a synagogue teaching, and the text lets us know there's a man with a right hand that shriveled. This is an important note. The right hand in the ancient world was the dominant hand. Pretty much everything was designed for that hand. 
So if your right hand didn't work, you were basically seen as useless. You couldn't work. You would put yourself in jeopardy. Your family might be in jeopardy. We don't know, maybe this man had a wife and kids. But it would have been very difficult for him to survive at that time because it's a much harsher world. And of course, isn't it interesting, the Pharisees are in the background waiting to see if Jesus will heal on the Sabbath so they can get mad at him. The problem is this isn't even in the Torah about healing. At the time, people would not do medical work on the Sabbath unless someone's life was in immediate danger. So if you were going to die, then yes, they might do something. But let's say, you know, we say break a leg is a lucky thing. But if you broke a leg on a Sabbath, they wouldn't treat you until the next day because, well, you're not going to die. Talk about awful house rules, the worst house rules. The Pharisees are more concerned with trapping Jesus than Jesus helping this man. They're leveraging the situation of a broken person who has to barely survive against Jesus. This goes against the heart of Sabbath. And Jesus will challenge them. Sabbath was about rest. It was about restoration. It was about being with God. And yet here the Pharisees want their house rules to rule. So in verse 8 and 9 it says, But he knew their thoughts. And he told the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand here. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil, to save your life or to destroy it? I wouldn't be surprised if this shriveled man had heard of Jesus. We know that Jesus' fame has gone all over Israel. We heard earlier in chapter 5 of how people came from Jerusalem just to hear Jesus. And I'm sure this man, he can see the Pharisees in the synagogue. He can feel the tension. Should he listen to this radical rabbi? And then Jesus, he stands up, and then Jesus points to the Pharisees and tells them about their heart. He's saying, your way of operating, your house rules are so backwards, you've totally misunderstood Sabbath. It's about bringing life. A Pharisee's refusal to help someone on Sabbath is actually doing evil. Jesus is saying, you guys are the evil ones, not me. Luke 6, 10 to 11, and after looking around at them, he told them, stretch out your hand. He did, and his hand was restored. They, however, were filled with rage and started discussing with one another what they might do to Jesus. What an interesting response to a miracle. Someone can now work again. Someone can make a living again. And what happens to the Pharisees? They're angry. They want their house rules to be the ones that rule. And Jesus frustrates them even further because he commands the man. He doesn't touch the man. He commands the man. The man obeys and listens. And what happens, Jesus heals them. Jesus has exposed their house rules. They're just falling apart. Their power is being challenged. Their power over the people. Their power over Sabbath. The way that they keep people in check. And the funny thing is the Pharisees can't even accuse Jesus of doing work because he hasn't done anything explicitly against oral law. He didn't even touch the man. Their house of rules is really just a house of cards. Worship team, could you please come up? On the other hand, the man with the withered hand is able to experience the life of Jesus for him because he was willing to submit. I'm sure it wasn't easy for that man to stand up. He probably felt the pressure of the Pharisees. He knew that they were the ones who had the control had the power, but he wants to work again. He wants to feed his family again, probably. The Pharisees, on the other hand, they want control of the house. They'll never experience the life that that man experienced. Do we want to play by our house rules? Are we Jesus-centered? Do we want control of our life? Are we willing to submit to Jesus? In the Jewish world, the laws around Sabbath were followed so closely by the Jewish people just the hope that Yahweh would do something. What do we consider sacred? Maybe our free time, our money, our house, our identity. Have we submitted these to Jesus? Our culture says we can decide what we want to do these things, and God does give us some leeway. He does give us stewardship. He does give us responsibility. But the problem is so easy for these things to take hold. What brings us security and peace? What are our house rules that we operate by? Our house rules will only bring us death. But being Jesus-centered will bring life. I find the things that we may make sacred often rule our life. They will monopolize our time. 
We begin to be consumed by them, to orientate our whole lives around them. And we begin to disengage from church. We begin to disengage from community, from people around us that love Jesus. I think we all know about hockey families where hockey is God. You know, where it's just like every single moment is spent on hockey. And it's not just hockey. It could be something else. It could be another sport. It could be another hobby. It could be something that we really enjoy. And these things are not bad in in and of themselves, but how easy it is for those things to slowly grab us and we begin to find identity and we begin to find meaning in these things. And then we're just starting to play by someone else's house rules. They slowly seep in. It's usually just a slow kind of grind. The Pharisees structured their life around the laws of Sabbath and Torah. What do we structure our lives around? Does Jesus ground us? Do we love like Jesus? Do we see like Jesus? Jesus wants us to follow him and his way of life. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this church. Thank you for your word. I thank you that you bring life and life to the full. Lord, be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank you for coming. Really appreciate you being here. I'm just going to end with a scripture reading from Jude, if that can be put up. But you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Have mercy on those who waver. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others but with fear, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling, to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. Be blessed.